Hi, everybody. My name is Joe Hoffberg, and my pronouns are she, her. I am a recovering American living in Berlin, Germany, and I have the pleasure today to speak with the utmostly incredible Gray Armstrong. So let's bring Gray Armstrong on. And obviously, we need a digital a round of applause over here, which I know, great. Look, I'm just doing white people things. So it's just one of these. We're just going to move on. Amazing. Uh, Gray, I also tried to match my hair to the things behind me just so that you also felt like you were in like good color company right now. Always, so, always in good color. Company. Always. So, Gray, for some of the people who have yet to have the pleasure to meet with you or work with you, may I have you introduce yourself? Uh, for sure. So, my name yeah. is Gray Armstrong and I use he, him pronouns. Uh, I'm a writer, a dance instructor, and just generally. Uh, artist, renaissance man, researcher person, and do all the things. Um, quick thing, Joe, is my connection as blurry for you as it is for me, or is that just on my side? You are not, you are soft lit. You've got this very nice, like RuPaul's Drag Race soft light thing going on. Okay. Because it... And if you haven't watched that, then that's not super helpful. But otherwise, yeah, I, I feel like mine is like in a uh, higher definition and you're like, we're just going to keep it classy and like make everybody's skin look super amazing. <laughs> when I'm in 480, I'm like, God, I am so pretty in 480. Like all that stuff is super smooth. It just out. makes everything look gorgeous. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit. So <laughs> the adventure. Great. I'm really appreciating how blue your hair is. Does this mean that you've dyed it recently? I did. I did. I'm very excited about it. Um, uh -huh. I had did you do it yourself or do you go in? Do you get somebody else to like give you that pamper process? Uh, you know, I used to. And um, the person who I learned how to do it from was the one who did my hair. And she died of cancer a few years ago. And so I kind of do it in honor of both myself and of her and her the lessons I learned from her. Uh, so yeah, the, I didn't mean to, to get so... Yeah, no, so no, no, that's okay. So that was just me having a moment of like, like oh, what why do we do? I <laughs> like, I thought about getting other people to do it, but... Um, you do it, in, on, you do it in honor of somebody. And, yeah. and you make it look good. So, hell yeah. Well, I mean, a bunch of people like pick this up during... Well, this is maybe me getting ready to put my foot in my mouth. A lot of people pick this up during the pandemic when they're like, you know what? looks like I have an opportunity to learn a new skill set because I'm kicking it at home. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I, I'm I, not going to ask a follow-up because I'm really just going to like dig myself into a hole and try not to do this like within the first three minutes of the, the interview. No, no, no. <laughs> you're, you're great. Like I, I had been doing my own hair for a while at that point, but like um, it definitely – helped me get more comfortable with with like when i messed up because everyone had uh -huh. messed up hair and i was like haha no one knows <laughs> <laughs> so i mean for some of you listening you might also know that like the topic of black hair is a very large topic which is not what we're getting into today even though it is a topic that could be discussed, but that's not what we're here for today. In fact, we are here for the fourth installment of Let's Talk About Blackness and Lindy Hop on the iLindy blog. So um, great, give me a quick uh, summary for you about like, how did it how did it feel at this part in the series? Cause you also wrote this a while ago. So you might have to like go into the way back machine. Like how did this, how, how, where were you at the time? Like either physically or just like mentally when you're like, wow, cause this was a big topic. This was not one of like of the smaller articles. Uh, yeah, this is the deification of Frankie Manning, right? I just wanna like. Yeah, make sure. it's that one. Yeah. It's yeah, when I was reading through, I was definitely like, <laughs> well, it's been said, it's out there. I'm get like, yeah. let's, um, let's hear from the people. Yeah, this piece was, when we were originally talking about this series, uh, this piece was the questionable one, the one I wasn't sure if I wanted to include or not. But as yeah. I started writing the history uh, for, uh, for part two, it became really apparent that it had to be included, it had to be written. And it was a discussion that needed to be started because I had... Um, talked more about it and realized that 
like talked more about it to other instructors, other organizers, and realized there was a conversation that was happening, but it was very hush hush. It was very quiet. There was a lot of um, feelings of shame and guilt around the conversation. And if you could say that, or if you couldn't say that, um, you know, and just like specifically around non-Black community members. And then with the Black community members, there was this like simmering frustration um, and in a lot of people being unsure of how to broach the subject in a way that felt socially safe. Mm. And so for me, I was like, well, I have a lot of thoughts on this. Um, I have the history to back it up. And whether or not like ultimately it's not about Frankie in so much that it is about the way that we choose what we value and who we value in our community. Mm. Mm. I'm going to just take a quick pause here, Greg, because I know that you can see this as well. Hey, Tim, if you're listening in the background, if you can just like take a quick look at the screen, that would be super, super great. Uh, there we go. Yeah, almost. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Nailing it. All right. Great. So, so great. One of the things that, um, and so Tim, by the way, when you comment there, <laughs> it shows up on the screen as well. <laughs> so friends, we are, we are having a great time over here and I think maybe we can just edit some of this. Uh. We can edit some of this out. So Tim, you'll have to <laughs> chat with us. Um, in the private chat, not in the public chat. That'd be great. Thanks. Okay, cool. I know, right? <laughs> Technology. We're all getting it together. Like you're soft lit. I've got colorful hair. I'm sure my audio is going to move all over the place. All right, cool. Editors, this is where you get to bring everything back together. So let's try this again. <laughs> okay. So, so great. This obviously is like a really big conversation. And I guess like when, when would you say this showed up in the black community or is it like we will get there but like that's not the place to start because like I, I assume that it would have been more comfortable to speak about this within the black community than it would have been with the white community but like I don't know why I'm what I'm basing that assumption on uh, I, I would I would say you're correct honestly I probably wouldn't know and I say that because I wasn't around my assumption right. is this conversation in some form or another has been happening since like, um, you know, Frankie became a figure to the community. Mm. I would assume, like it would not surprise me if that was kind of a private discussion that was happening mm. of, you know, why is it that he is, his voice is becoming the only voice that is listened to? Why is mm. my voice not being valued? why do I feel like I'm fighting against this like image of Frankie um, if I want to like participate? You know, that's part of why I bring up the point of what would the scene have been like had Al Men's hung around a bit longer, like had mm. been around longer? Like, would it be the same? And probably not. Mm. What do that you looks think like, I don't know, but it's, it's a thought. <laughs> Do you think there could have been more space at the top or do you think it's very much been set as like it's a pyramid so there's only one chair which means there's only one man that gets to sit in it? I think it I think it could have been more space at the top. Um mm -hmm. because ultimately the other figures that people respected that were black at the time were women. Mm -hmm. Do you yeah. mean at large or do you mean in the black community? Uh, I mean, at large. Okay. So like, in the black community, you know, I'm, I'm a big proponent of the thought that we are matriarchal. Mm -hmm. So like, we value women and men in a very different way than white culture tends to. Mm -hmm. So like a woman having the power is not unheard of, even mm -hmm. if it is not labeled as such. Like, mm. it's not, like, for instance, it's not the preacher who has the power, it's the preacher's wife. 
It's not, uh-huh. you know, like it's the it's the the grandma on the back who like just quietly is sitting there in her big hat that actually has the most power in that mm-hmm. scenario, not the man who's talking to the the, the well like powerful white guy. Yeah, yeah, you know, okay, like yeah. it's and so one, I always wonder, you know, how that factored in, but also when you start taking into account how white people are perceiving that, you know, they're going to look over the female voices for the man voice. And Mm. the only man who was black that was like primarily dancing and teaching at that time, Mm. like Leon had died by that point. Mm. Al was around for the very beginning but died mm-hmm. not so, like not long into the 80s from my understanding yeah. um like these are some of the original folks like a lot of the other ones had already gone and so mm-hmm. you get into this this spot of well what does white culture respect and it's like well they respect men mm-hmm. they respect um like authenticity mm-hmm. and comfort in some ways, from Black people. And so if you had, you know, a female confrontational um, person being like, not letting white people be comfortable, who are you If we were to? gonna give this character a name, could we maybe just say like Norma, just like pulling a random name you know, out? You know, Norma. like that. There's a, sure. there's a there's a there's a few, but Norma is like the easy kind of one to to put out there of like uh-huh. you know people people give people treated Norma differently than Frankie, even though mm. <laughs> like they they were equally as um, you know prolific in their work, and in some ways yeah. Norma more so because she continued to dance and Frankie did not. That was something I really appreciated about the article is how clearly you laid that out where it was like, all right, so after the war, Frankie came back and made a choice that he was going to, you know, go find other work instead of continuing to uh, have artistic pursuits. And like, what does that mean? And like, and as we uh, follow the historical line, like getting to come back at 60 as a celebrity after having lived the life he had, like, who wouldn't take that chance, who wouldn't take up that offer, even at the cost or the price that needed to be paid. Exactly. And I think like Norma in that way had already, um, you know, she, she stayed as an artist. And so she had also like had other avenues for that, you know? And so the price might have been, not as high like she wasn't will- she might not have been willing to go for that price that that high of a price for like right. to have artistic celebration mm. because she could do other things like and she, she certainly did other things as well she, you know she she had other things right. going for her she had other things that she was working on and working through and and going yeah. with and i'm not saying that frankie didn't have other things but like right at least in our understanding, or my understanding, I'll say, of like what opportunities were available, how you could continue as an artist at the time, that, you know, does matter. And so mm. it's not this like, oh, Frankie went into the post office and then like we we found him and saved him from this life. It's like Frankie came back and he didn't think that the dances that were currently happening were interesting to him. And he didn't decide to pursue an artistic career. Mm. And not saying that that was easy, but like his other compatriots did do that. So, you know, when you look at it that way, rather than like, oh, we found him from this life of squalor and we saved him, it has a very different vibe to it. It has a very different feeling to it of Frankie being a man with agency who made some choices. Yeah. And 
that being okay, but acknowledging that rather than being like, ah, oh, they like took this legend and they put him in the, they put him in the post office. That's like, <laughs> that's, you know, like that, that's the vibe I get a lot of the time when people talk about it uh, versus it being like, yeah, Frankie lo loved his art and went to the war. Yep. And then as black art does, it continued and he decided he wasn't interested in continuing with that black art form for a while. Yeah. I, uh, Gray, I mean, the, the word that really stands out that you shared was agency. And what does it mean to have agency and to be allowed to have agency? And when one story is retold, having that included or having that removed? Um, do So this was something I was thinking about because I have li I listened to the article. I read the article. I listened to the article. Um, yay for technology, being able to like read things. Um, and I guess one of the things that and like you are also welcome to be like, Joe, I obviously don't have an answer to this, but do you think, do you think Frankie could have done something about this? Right. Like, cause like on one hand, I, I mean, I assume that there was enough people that knew what was going on and are like, could, sorry, they could see the writing on the wall that it was like, okay, this man has been elevated. There's a bunch of us still here that went unnamed, unknown, unseen by the white community for a really long time. So it's not like, I mean, it would be shocking if Frankie couldn't see what was going on. Like I assume everybody was able to see to some degree what was going on. Do you think that the, could, like that he could have done something or because of also the time and the inner workings of the communities, it's just like, no, the, the like the price, like think about like the price to pay, like out of context, like, or like with context, the answer is clear. No. I think, I think there's a couple of different factors here. And this is kind of me as making some like cultural based assumptions because I was not there. I did not meet these people. Yeah. Um, but typically in these scenarios, there's almost a like, well, we're glad that somebody's getting recognition. Mm. And so, although there may be like, in, in the community discussions about this, you want to present as a uh, unified front in terms of outsiders. Mm. So if, for instance, like you wouldn't want to ruin this thing for Frankie by yeah. expressing um, Dissatisfaction. frustration at, yeah. at the lack of opportunities for everyone else and mm. that they are going for a very particular like type of black person. Then I also think about the time where I'm like, well, this is the eighties. So, you know, we've had civil rights for 15 years. God, when you say it like that, Gray, geez. Yeah. <laughs> I, right. But math. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, 15 to 20 years. That That's yeah. not, that's not that long of a time, which also right. means that those are people who lived through segregation. Right. And, you know, like, <laughs> you start doing the math and you're like, oh, yeah. well, you know, of, of course you don't rock the boat. Of course you don't, um, you know, you have your feelings, but what you feel and this is still a thing that happens for a lot of black folks is like what yeah. you feel and what you're allowed to express in white company are very different things mm. i wish we had an instant replay button so that we could just like do that again <laughs> we can do that in post <laughs> gray do you feel like that statement is really surprising for the white community like just like oh yeah that's like a great reminder like when a friend drops like a really great piece of wisdom that you're like mm -hmm, versus like I've never considered that I don't know I don't know I as much as you know I I make jokes about being the white whisperer you know it's hard to see the water <laughs> it's hard to see the water you're swimming in you know like in some uh -oh. ways, I know a lot about white people. I I love researching y'all. They fascinate me. Y'all are so <laughs> weird and interesting. And like, like <laughs> so much just doesn't make sense. But in that not uh -huh. making sense, there are a lot of blind spots for me. There are things I assume you mm -hmm. know 
because mm. it's common knowledge in my culture that you don't know. Right. And this right. could be one of those things where to me, it's like, well, obviously we don't tell you everything. Right. <laughs> like, I guess what that's happens fair. When we kind of tell you things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just look at what happens. So for my fellow white women out there, just imagine in case you like could appreciate an analogy here um, in the same way that we have private conversations that some of the information makes it to the men in our lives or make it to, makes it to the men in our community. We don't share everything. They obviously have blind spots where it's like, well, we understand this about you because we need to understand this about you sometimes for our safety, but just because it's it's an everyday occurrence that we just happen to know about because we grew up under this, like under that pressure, just with this awareness. So it might not be our lived experience as in like, we didn't grow up as men, but we are very aware of them. So like other, like people that look like me, in case that was helpful, you're welcome. And if I just wasted your time, I hope you fast forwarded. You're welcome. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it's a time waste because I do use that as an, a way to get people, um, to kind of connect with it, even though like mm. being a white minority is a different experience. Um, yeah. Being able to, because I use this with queer people too, of like, mm. you know, that thing that we talk about like in private versus how you express it to other people. I'm like, yeah, it's yeah. like that. But when you're queer and black, you just add a layer, you know, <laughs> like you just, you just add, it just adds <laughs> up. And then, you know, you everything you do is curated. <laughs> It's like a decadent cake, but, oh, that was the direction I was going. But if everything has to be curated, then maybe that is not a very good analogy. Just, it sounds like it's getting complicated. And the, of the intersections of all of these things and having so few people um, con connected to the community so they don't have the education or they don't have the sense on, here's why this is important to know. Imagine a world that you could live in where lots of people got to feel the same comforts you did every day. Yeah, I mean, this I is why. I guess you have to be aware of your comforts. Oh, sorry. Uh, please, sorry. Saying, Internet connection. Yeah, I was saying this is why uh, intersectionality matters. Mm hmm. Say, say it for the people in the back. <laughs> I will just like edit that little banner that comes across. <laughs> <laughs> intersectionality. Thanks, Blair, yeah. <laughs> I love it. So, okay, so great. Let's see. What other silly questions did I have that? Uh, okay, so maybe this is better for later. And again, totally feel free to be like, Joe, we'll talk about that, like kind of near the end of all of this. But like, yeah. what is the best way to dismantle some of this deification? Because, and obviously, like, it's not a simple thing. Having knowledge of this is a really helpful place to start. But it's got to be, it has to be more involved than just knowing about it. Because there's a lot of people who've been reading books over the last two years, but not a whole lot has changed. Like, there's been a little bit of a scratch on the surface, but there hasn't been a really huge dent. So not that I'm yeah. telling you anything great that you don't already know, but hopefully for any of any of the other people that are stepping in what I'm putting down. <laughs> yeah. Later in the series, we talk a little bit more about praxis, which is like yeah. the taking the idea and putting it into practice um, where I get into more specifics. But I think actually at this point in the series, I would encourage people to consider what they know and where they mm. learned that information from. Because mm. the reason why Frankie is deified at this point is because that's the knowledge that we pass on verbally. A lot of the community isn't from an oral culture. So y'all don't understand how this works in some ways, but like what yeah. you say creates a story. The story is how people learn things. And in those stories, that's how they learn what to value, what to prioritize, what how they're supposed to behave, what they're supposed to be like, what it means to be in this community. Mm. And the story of Frankie is a part of that. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about what's written, but also that. And then if you take that info and you use that as your basis to write a book or mm. to facilitate a class, or something else without challenging where did i learn that like and who told me that and where and why mm. um, you get into this kind of self-fulfilling thing which is why i talk about in the book that or not the book it's gonna be a book but why i talk about in the what? <laughs> 
We're going to count back from five. Gray, you frozen. Yeah. So five and four, three, two, and okay. one. Jeez. Okay. I can hear you. Okay. There we That's go. And we're back. <laughs> That's, it's probably my fault. It's the, the new place I'm living. I really need to get an, an internet extender, I think. <laughs> for my we can, room. We if, can get that together for next time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that will help. It's been a thing. And then every time I'm on a call, I'm like, oh, yeah, I need to do that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I need to do that. <laughs> <laughs> we oh, all yeah. have. We, I think yeah. we all have. Oh, uh, well, I've got like a little list of that. I just put them on random post-it notes and then I hide the post-it notes so that I can push off being responsible until a little bit later because I'm going to still- a fun surprise. <laughs> yeah, right? Surprise. I still have things I need to do. So great. I think one of the things I'm hearing is that like dance teachers are responsible for the things that they say, for the things that they come out of their mouth. Words matter and they should probably understand what they're passing on when uh, they're teaching. Is that one of the things I should take away, Gray? Did I hear you correctly? <laughs> you did. And also, not just teachers. Really? Uh, Who else is maybe responsible? <laughs> maybe organizers and community members. This is wild. So it sounds like the entire community has an opportunity to be more responsible in their storytelling about what they're doing and who are the people to, uh, and whose shoulders are we standing on? Am I getting that right, Gray? You are. This is amazing. <laughs> it, on a practical note, I would actually encourage people to, like, of course, read read the blog of the, like, read the the article series that's been going on if you haven't been. Um, but also to start, there are a lot of videos out there, some of which I will share, um, where it's interviewing different people. And don't get me wrong, you should definitely watch the Frankie interviews because they're, mm. you know, like, it, it's good stuff. Frankie is a good dancer and was a good guy and like all of the things. Um, but watching an Al Min's interview, like the two parts of him talking to the Swedes in the 80s was just mm. like mind blowing. It yeah. made me realize how much, you know, how much we don't talk about or how much of his experience has gotten lost over the years, um, mm. what it was like to be found by Swedish people who just rolled up in the club one day looking for him and he was concerned they were the mafia, I think. And it was I just like, understand why that would have been terrifying. <laughs> he was just like, why did, how did y'all find me? Like, right. <laughs> they, just, they just found him at the club, and he, yeah. you know? And we hear the Getting stories of like, oh yeah, the Swedish came over and they found these dancers, but we never like actually heard, hear specifically like what that experience was like. And he talks a mm. little bit about being flown over there and like teaching these these people who had been learning from like, I think he was saying like learning from video and he's just kind of like blown away by this and a little confused and a little like, you know, sometimes the interviewers would ask these questions and he'd get kind of shy and awkward because he's like, oh, I don't want to say it. And they're like, go ahead, say it. Like, there's the whole line in there about jitterbug and where that term comes from. And just yeah. like, it brings a certain life and depth back to the stories and the ways we think about that time period and the people's experiences in it. There's also mm. like, the comment and from Norma, where she says, like in an interview, uh, they just need to watch Frankie. But in context, yeah. she's talking about, you need to watch him to get a feel for the dance and stop worrying about counts. You should be watching, mm. you should be watching how he listens to music, not you need to dance like Frankie. You need to emulate mm. Frankie down to the T. That's not what she was saying. And so you start to realize like, oh, there's these other perspectives that exist. They're harder to find, yeah. but they exist and they start to create a fuller picture of what it was like at the time. You know, there are some dancers who are still around that I interviewed who um, were dancing really early into the 
white stream popular repopularization of Lindy Hop. Mm -hmm. And the stories that people in the 90s tell is very different than the stories that people who started in the 80s tell versus yeah. who started in the early 2000s. Like you can really clearly see a big difference in like how people talk about Frankie, how people talk about the scene, how they talk about what was important to them, what wasn't important to them. Like there's just a lot more depth rather yeah. than just this story of oh we found frankie in the post office and then we saved him and then he became our messiah like mm. frankie was a amazing dancer who also at the end of the day was just a man yeah i i thought that that uh Near the end of your article, you have a paragraph that very much, well, you have multiple paragraphs that basically all point to this very same space. Let me see if I even have it right here. Um, great. Do you mind if I read something? There was a lot of stuff I wanted to read and some of it I was like, well, one, I, I shouldn't be saying some of this because it's, I have the author here, but also some of the things I'm just like, well, they're like, as I statements, they're not true. But uh, <laughs> are, you, are you okay if I like read one of uh, one of the paragraphs about this very topic? Yeah, I'm down for that, for sure. Okay, cool. So um, you say, it is important to look at Frankie as a man and not just a figure because he was who so many looked up to and looked at as a teacher. He has to be seen as more than just an image of the values people want to superimpose onto the dance. His legacy shouldn't dwarf the voices of his peers to the point that knowing anything about them is seen as being well-educated. Frankie's styling and beliefs shouldn't smother the expressions and experiences of the art form. His perspective shouldn't invalidate the rest of ours. I thought that was incredibly powerful. And like when I've read it, I've definitely been like, ooh, I feel all the feels. Just like to, I mean, one, to remind people of like, hey, with this particular person, but also just the sense of like, just like the higher the hierarchy that has been imposed, but also like as as like a recovering perfectionist as well, just trying to remember of like, you can't, like you don't want to compare yourself to others. And yet for so many of us that know that have been told that have been supported by coaches and mentors not to compare ourselves to others. Yet we managed to recreate that in Lindy Hop where we've now specifically created this comparison that is almost inescapable, not only in the art form, but for another, a number of its community members. And it just was like, which is, I don't know, like a lot of things fired for me when I read that, where it was like, wow, okay. I mean, here's the thing. Here's the kicker, yeah. though, is it's not just that it's a comparison that, like, is bad for comparison's sake. It's not even being compared to a person. It's being compared to an idea. Because we're not being compared to Frankie directly. Like, mm. ultimately. And that was kind of the real point of the piece, was like... yeah. There's Frankie, the person who did amazing things and contributed a lot to the community. And then there's Frankie, the idea. Mm. And the idea of Frankie is what all of us get compared to, including any dissenting voices about Frankie. Like, even if you go, well, you know, I, I heard this Frankie say this thing and people are like, Frankie would never say that. And you're like, he did. He's a man. He said the thing. And people are like, <laughs> no, Frankie would never. I love your code switch right there. It was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> he would never, Jeff. <laughs> By golly, George, he would never <laughs> say that. And, and, and that, yeah. that's really important. Uh, yeah. It's bad enough to be compared to someone else. Mm. But to be compared to a vision that isn't even like embodying of one whole person to be like, you have to meet this standard. Mm. And it has to be a standard that makes me feel good or you are invalidated is incredibly painful and inappropriate. Mm. Like to his legacy and to everyone around him. Like, and in like, that like his peers, his descendants, his his legacy, like everything around that is also inappropriate. 
dear community, I hope you feel like you just got a finger wagged at you because you just did. But you have the opportunity, you have the opportunity to be like, I know how I can do better. So I hope that's the case, community. <laughs> yeah, I, I just, hope so. <laughs> yeah. I mean, right. These are the steps. These are the steps. So, so great. I, you've kind of already mentioned this, but let me just go back around just because I can imagine that something like this will come up again. Mm -hmm. So great. Like I know this stuff though. Like, did you talk with somebody? Like, is this you just like sharing your personal experience or do you feel like this comes from the larger community? Or I'm like, specifically, like, have you had other conversations? And I know we've talked about this, but I just want to make sure that if somebody has that question, um, that you have clarified your standpoint on it. Yeah. Um, so for this series, I did a series of interviews. I also did mm -hmm. some questionnaires at the very beginning. So part one includes some of those quotes and the last one will also include a few quotes. Um, without me prompting, a few different people mentioned being compared to Frankie Manning as a thing that they felt um, was hindering their experience in the community and causing them to not feel like they could be themselves. Mm. Um, in the interviews, that was a thing that came up was the, the conversations, um, uh, well, like the conversations with uh, non-Black community members, I would ask a question of like, what was Frankie like? You know, what what did he teach like? What did, what did he, I was trying to ask the question of like, what did Frankie teach in his classes? Like what values did he teach? What was he, what was important to him to impart to you? Um, yeah. And I would get statements about how, how good and magical he was. I would get statements about how, oh, I got to meet Frankie. And I was like, that's great. Did you take any of his classes? Like, what was he what was he like as a person? Like, what did, you know, what what did he like what, what did he have any good jokes? Like, like what was his classroom management like? Like what what yeah. was learning from him like? And then I'd get, yeah. you know, he's just so amazing. It was incredible to just spend time with him and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I see that there's a disconnect here mm. between me asking about the man and me getting comments about the the deity mm -hmm. and realizing that was a big part of why I was like, oh, I have to actually write about this. Um, and then additionally to that, like, have I had conversations about it? Yeah, I have. Um, like, I've had professional conversations with non-Black people about it. I've had private conversations with Black people about it. Um, I, you know, feel very complexly about the idea of the Frankie Manning Foundation, um, or, and of statements like the ambassador of Lindy Hop, you know, because at some point it's like, well, when do, when does that legacy get passed on? When do the rest of us get to have an impact, have a say, have a voice? When is it that our expressions or other expressions of other people, peers, family, friends, legacy holders, also get to make an impact? You know, even the ambassador program from Frankie Manning Foundation, and this is not me dragging them, uh, like, it highlights certain values that are like, mm -hmm. well, Frankie presented these values, so this is what we want to celebrate. And even in that, it makes and chooses and highlights certain Black people as being good enough. Mm. And to be good enough, you have to adhere to a very strict guidelines of respectability politics, basically. Mm. So like, that kind of creates its own paradigm and it's the same one with like the trying to figure out you know how to win a competition as a black person it's like well if you dress and move like frankie you have a much higher likelihood of being able to do it if you move like you also dance b-boy and 
you wore jeans in the comp. Are you gonna do as well? Probably not. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Great, let's say somebody, I know, I'm like, huh. I have like 75 follow-up questions, but I'm gonna just try to be choiceful about this. Let's say somebody else was just like, okay, so it sounds like there's space, like getting foundation, there is an ambassador program. Um, if that's the main one, maybe there is space, or sorry, it sounds like there is space that somebody else could maybe get something up and going so that there was another support structure so that there wasn't only one. What could that look like that would be, I that could be so one avenue? What would be another way to create something supportive that would open maybe a wider avenue? Um, so one, I, I believe that Hello Black Lindy Hop um, is doing some incredible things. Like, yeah. uh, and I believe they set up an ambassador program as well. Uh, oh, nice. That just took applications. I did not qualify for various reasons. That's absolutely fine. Um, not in like respectability, it's just like in terms of what projects they were wanting to highlight. I was like, I am not actually doing that right now. Um, yeah. But that is something that that I would suggest uh, more so, I think sometimes people assume that in these conversations, you need to reinvent the wheel. Mm. That like, oh, we're starting from nothing. And it's like, people have already been doing this work and people have already been doing these things. It's finding who's already doing that work and supporting it and also yeah. questioning the structures that already exist. So like that comment about comps. Yeah. If you're a competition coordinator at your event, whether that's a big event or a small event, looking at things like, you know, do you have to smile to win the comp? Because mm -hmm. that's a Frankie thing. That's a thing that people pull from Frankie specifically. Like, mm. Well, the deification bit. I don't know right. about Frankie as, as like an individual, if he was constantly smiling, but those are yeah. the clips that get shared. Those are the things that are said. And like, so you can't smile, but like if you're having a bad night and you don't want to smile during the comp, should you right. have to, if that doesn't affect your dancing? You know, like, does everybody have to mm. dress in vintage? Do you... Uh, have to like swing out in the form that Frankie swings out in, mm. you know, because that there's a lot of stylist stylization that he did there that isn't actually yeah. inherent to the dance. And a lot of the like higher level um, dancers know this, but we, but it still does get prioritized. Great. Are you by any chance available for like organizers or people who want to become judges? Like, are you available to hire? To I see some of these things. It's really funny because with my my slightly delayed connection, I'm like, I can't quite tell if you're just leading or if you are actually curious. Like, not that you're not actually curious. If you already know the answer, if you're just leading, because I only have voice. Uh, but yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> you are fabulous. Well, that's that's really good. They're looking to be budding judges, or you have been judging, and you would like to be able to make a really positive impact in a different way, or that there are some blind spots that you're unaware of. It sounds like maybe you've kind of met your man about like somebody who you could go check in with. Um, great, uh, great. I'm guessing that people could probably find you online for that. This isn't a wrap up. This is just one of those like this seemed like a great opportunity to say something. Where can people <laughs> find you, Gray? Uh, yeah, I mean, you can find me most places. Um, I would suggest emailing me Gray Armstrong Dance at Gmail is the most clear way to get in contact with me for business stuff. Um, if you Facebook message me, it will get lost. Um, <laughs> it just, it will. If you uh, put it on a post-it and then hide it in the house, you'll find it, Gray. <laughs> yeah, of course. Or if I put it where I think I'll, I'll, I'll remember to come back to that. <laughs> And then, yeah. and then <laughs> um, but yeah, like I, I actually really 
one of the things I love about the blue scene is like a lot of the organizers have really um, looked at their competitions and mm. decided what values they very clearly want you to be judging for and waiting for. Mm. Um, so it's not just like, there's here's some personal taste, but there's also a lot of like, okay, this competition values partnership above all else. Yeah. Gray, are these explicitly said in the blues community? So somebody that yes. comes from the Lindy Hop community, many competitions are, here's a clipboard. That's the name of the competition, go judge. And it's pretty straightforward. And I assume it's because there's a high level of trust as well as like, well, you've, you know, you've been in the scene, you get the competition, like we've hired. But are you, so, but you are saying like, there are explicit conversations around what the values are and, and what the alignment for the event is. Absolutely. We actually, depending on the, every event does it a little differently. Um, mm. But most events don't just rely on your perspective, but they rely on your skill of assessment. So for instance, if I'm judging at say Blues Muse, which highlights the importance of follower voice and partnership, their criteria for winning is going to be very different that if, say, I am judging at uh, Austin Blues Party, where their focus is on fun and community and uh, social dancing specifically. So mm. like, versus if I were, which I haven't really judged, I mean, I have for the competitions where you everybody who dances also judges. Uh, yeah. Judging at Shout would be yeah. like, you know, flashes a bit more forward than in other places. Mm. So, are these voted on by the community? Like, did the community get together and go, these are the things that we want to highlight because it best supports and honors the legacy? Is this just like a couple of key people like drew the long straw? Like, how did you guys get here? How, how did the, sorry, how did y'all get there? Uh, the, you know, again, journeys that started before I was here. Um, yeah. But in some ways, like having these types of conversations that we're having right now and realizing that if we want competitions to come out differently, we need to be transparent both to competitors and to judges about what we expect you to be judging on so people mm. can know what they need to highlight. So there are some like overarching things that typically are ranked quite high, like uh, aesthetic, <laughs> like, are you in the uh -huh. blues aesthetic? Like, uh -huh. is a thing that is traditionally ranked pretty high, if not the highest thing. But are we talking like that, smiles? Are we talking like smiles and vintage clothes? <laughs> yes, exactly. No. Uh, we're talking about movement. We're talking about, okay. um, like, are you doing the foundational skills of the dance? If you are in a comp where you have to kind of do um, it's the equivalent of having a competition where one song is Lindy Hop, one song is Bow, one song is Shag, and can you do the basics in all of those? Yeah. Do you have that down? And then we judge everything else of like, mm. what did you do with that? How were musical were you? What was your styling like? And then individual organizations weigh those things differently depending on what the values are for their specific event. So there's like scene-wide values that yeah. have kind of been negotiated out that create a bit mm -hmm. of a check and balance system and they can change over time and they have. Um, yeah. And then there's individual event values as well, mm. which they can decide to highlight or de-highlight, de-emphasize, I suppose. Uh -huh. <laughs> values. I was like, do you highlight as on the word? That's no, I mean, I lo I'm look here, <laughs> here in Europe. It would be, it would make sense because you're like, you know what? I don't speak a third language. Sure, why not? We are going to call it de-highlight. <laughs> <laughs> Delightful. <laughs> Okay, so great. Why blue scene sounds like they are on a really great path to being able to create a vision for the identity and the events and the competitions, which I am guessing it works in a similar way, which oftentimes through competitions is where teachers are born. That, so, the, the, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, it's interesting. I taught at Blues Muse um, earlier this month. And one of the discussions that I 
kept coming back to as I was teaching classes and doing lectures was this idea of we are now as a scene at the point where we have solidified our values intentionally enough over many years of discomfort and pain and like negotiations and awkwardness and fighting that we're no we're all on the same page um mm. he's gonna hate that i'm gonna bring this up but it's it's such a good moment that's important uh, so one of the best djs in the scene charlie ward uh, uh -huh. has only been dancing for a few years but he's a blues musician so he's got great mm. musical taste um wide range of skill wide range of music and it's it's like two in the morning on saturday night and i'm exhausted and i'm in the back room and you know near the floor but like i i you know i'd stayed way too long um and then i hear the opening notes to gravity by john mayer and to people who weren't in the dance scene yeah. a while ago, or like in the blue scene a while ago, this was this song was played all the time. And the song itself yes. is not actually the problem because although the song isn't, the song is played by blues musicians, whether you consider it blues or not specifically, and in like mm -hmm. musical sense is debatable, but also John Mayer is an accomplished blues guitarist and some people don't know that. Mm -hmm. What actually matters is what that song represented which was a time in our community where people would commonly say, oh, blues is that sexy dance where you can do whatever you want. There are no rules in blues. And so I awoke from the slumber. Yeah. <laughs> and I opened the door and, and I was like, well, I don't know what year it is. What's happening? <laughs> and in this, I'm walking through the crowd and I, I assumed it was an older DJ uh, whom like, I really, I also really respect. And I was like, that seems out of character for her, but like, what's the likelihood that Charlie, who's not been around, is gonna play this song that was so overplayed and so saturated that it came to represent a time frame in our whole community. I was like, what's the likelihood of that? It's like, it's not very likely. It's gotta be Susan. <laughs> And as I'm walking through, I see Susan, because I'm walking to the DJ booth, because I'm like, who, yeah. what is happening? Yeah. And I see Susan, and she's like, it's not me. <laughs> and I'm like, OK. And then I see Charlie, and he's got this look on his face. He's just grinning. And I'm looking out into the crowd, and I see two-thirds to three-fourths of the community has no idea why one-third to one-fourth of the community is losing their shit they don't understand because to them blues aesthetic blues basics is so ingrained they don't question that blues is black they don't question that you need to pulse they don't question that there are basics that you do need to do certain things that there are expectations there are values there are all of these things so to them it was just another blue song but oh, it's on the like kind of edge of blues because it's John Mayer, Teehee. And for the older community members, we had flashbacks. <laughs> you know, we had we went back in time. And for me specifically, yeah. I'm using this phrase very literally as someone with PTSD, literally did not know what year it was, was having flashbacks. And I'm like, what is happening? Like, where am I? What is happening? Uh, yeah. And I'm noticing this as I'm walking up to Charlie and he looks at me and he's got this look on his face and I'm like, what are you playing? <laughs> and we get into this like big like play fight moment of me just being like, you can't do this. And he's like, what do you mean? And I'm like, I know you don't understand. Yeah. But like this song represents a lot more to some of the community than others. And like, it's still too soon but also in that moment, it made me check myself and realize that at large, our community has moved mm. past that. It has moved into mm. an iteration where we don't need to be as strict 
bash traditionalists to make sure that people actually dance the dance. People just dance the dance. They just know it's black. They don't fight us on this because we put in all of this work and all of this expectations and all of this like time and energy and like the movement from the top, the movement from the bottom, these discussions that happened, there's the Ellie article, there's my site, there's all of this effort culminated in this moment of two thirds to three fourths of this community has no idea why Gray is storming across the room <laughs> To chat with the DJ and then being like, having to tell Charlie and I'm like, Charlie, this was a song that people used to body roll to. And he's like, no. And I'm like, yeah. Yes. They used to like do- Please tell me you body rolled when you were saying this. Yes. (laughs) It literally was like- They used to do this to it. (laughs) And he was just like, no. What? He's like, I play this song at my blues gigs. And, and you know, and I was like, I know you do. And I get that. But also, I know you do. <laughs> but also contextually in this community, this song makes yeah. me think of drunk white people in their early 20s body rolling and, and grinding on each other and then calling it blues and then being like blues, this whole like, genre of dances that has so much legacy to it and this music that also has a lot of legacy to it uh Mm. has no rules you can do whatever you want Mm. and so it's both like most of the community members don't know what that's like they weren't there right so we have the opportunity to ease up some on the like strictness, the traditionalness of it. Yeah. And we can get to being more innovative, being more creative, exploring more. Um, it doesn't need to be frozen in time anymore, the dance. Um, and I think that like was an important moment and an important conversation to have. And I think that only could have happened because of a lot of the work that like the community as a connecting like force and also the people Mm -hmm. that are teaching and also the people that are judging and also the organizers really challenging their beliefs that like, Mm -hmm. like a big, it was very contentious to be like flash is being devalued. What's being valued is aesthetic. It's like having the foundational things done, even at the highest level of levels. Yeah. That was a huge deal. It was a huge controversy. Uh, because people are like, but I like Flash, and Flash is cool, and it, it, it signals certain levels of um, competency, and it does. And also, you have to be able to do the dance. Yeah. <laughs> Full stop. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and that was a really hard few years for us, was trying to figure out how to get everybody up to date and up to skill on the dance. And so with with Lindy Hop specifically, asking the questions of, well, what do we value? What do we want this dance to be like? Do we want it to be innovative and creative and fun and expressive like it was? Or do we want it to be fast and technical? Mm. And those two things can exist at the same time. Or even you could have one bit that highlights the innovativeness, the creativeness, the exploration, and one that highlights specifically speed and technical prowess. Yeah. But if you never question it, you are only going to default to the oldest and most mundane version of whatever it is as being excellent. I have to get my charging cord. It's just, I'm just gonna like lean over for a second, but like. That's totally fine, Greg. I I want you to stay uh, plugged in for, in all of the ways really. (laughs) So, I mean, like, so great while you're over there with the assumption that you can still hear me. Um, I mean, this is just like such a fascinating conversation to have as, as I'm like reflecting upon the Lindy Hop community and the events that I have judged at over the last decade or so and the conversations that I think are starting to happen. And it, you know, it depends on on where you are. And there's a bunch of phenomenal people like 
doing the work. But by and large, it, it community I don't think has gone through this this renaissance where they're like, okay, cool. So like, this is one of the things that we need to do and let's push out the press release and be like, y'all, we need to talk about this so that we can do this. And like Europeans, you are also responsible for this because you are also throwing events and you are continuing on with Lindy Hop and you're teaching Lindy Hop and you've got people making full-time living with Lindy Hop. So you are also responsible for this as well. And here's how we're going to work on this collectively, because it might seem like this is a huge hill to climb, but we're going to need to do it together. And the other side is actually not scary. The other side brings a level of joy and connectedness that we are not experiencing yet. Am I kind of close, Gray? Or are you just like, Joe, you completely missed it? No, no, no. You're, you're exactly right. And, and ultimately, like, a thing I tell people, which is hard, for people to understand is you are never going to please everyone and it's okay for people to leave. Mm. So here's the thing. It's like, if you set aside a value of we want this dance to be more inclusive, there are going to be people who like the dance the way it is and they're not going to want to stay. They're going to yeah. complain. They're going to be upset. And you need to decide who is your audience? Who do you care about? Who do you value? You mm. know, like, do you value creativity and freedom in Lindy Hop enough to piss some people off? Because some people who were at the top of the pile are going to find themselves sliding down really quick. And they're going to feel some kind of way about it. And then they're going to have to make a decision of, are you going to get on the board or are you going to get off? And that's yeah. that's a reality. And that's a terrifying reality. And there's a lot of ego hits in there. And there's a lot of feelings. And, you know, people are going to be like, I want to go back to the good old days. And, you know, people then forget that the good old days weren't that good. Or the good old days were contextually good because you were young and you were drinking. And that's just what it was. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Make America swing again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't know. I could totally see that happening. Uh, you set it not, up. You set it up. I know. I mean, I agree. I'm days, just saying it wouldn't about surprise it. me if there's hat two start and Article around. 3. I think it was in both in article two and three you mentioned those <laughs> it, oh I mean, it, somebody it might surprise make a me if that if that does happen yeah. but like being willing to not just allow frankie's legacy or frankie to be a man and be probably more complex than anybody gives him credit for at least mm -hmm. publicly from what i've seen Mm -hmm. uh, also recognizing that, yes, he did bring in some beautiful values yeah. and he wasn't the only set of values. And the best way to honor his legacy is to honor the dance that he loved. And to honor his contribution to that dance, like you can't, you know, I'm not saying like you can't honor him, but I am saying like, the dance is bigger than Frankie. Yeah. And it always has been. And so if we constrain ourselves to be basically what Frankie has been, has been projected upon and yeah. white values and then wonder why doesn't the dance, why isn't it going anywhere? Why is it stuck? Why is it? Yeah. You know, why has nothing changed? It's like, well, it hasn't changed because one, we're using the same values, but then two, like white culture doesn't innovate in this way with historical things. They'll prefer right. to preserve it, um, which like is one way of respecting the past. And another way of respecting the past is to build upon it mm -hmm. respectfully with a foundation, not just like going off and taking it and then like, being like, it's like if you if you have a tree and you like take that tree and you like cut it out of the ground and then you take it somewhere else and you're like, grow, grow tree, why aren't you growing? And it's like, it's not the same soil. You just like messed up that tree for a while. The tree's very upset, you know? Yeah. 
at some point the tree may like reroot, yeah. but probably not mm. because you don't shop the tree. Like, but but what's more likely is like you could take um, some of that soil with the tree. You know, you can create a planter box. You can do like other things that like still let you bring the tree, but you bring the yeah. nutrients with it. You bring what it needs to survive. And then you can appreciate it in that way versus trying to force it to adjust to you. Yeah. Trees. <laughs> <laughs> Nature. I was just like, what am I, what am I on right now? Like, no, I love it. No, I was just like, well, I think you're going to, th I think that you'll bring that full circle, like the circle of life. Amazing. Yeah, uh... So, um, great. I definitely feel like we could go for another hour, but um, probably in uh, in lieu of keeping this at about an hour, it seems like this might be a really good point to wrap up. And uh, maybe our editors can also make this small sections so people can more easily get through this. Yeah. Um, great. Is there any question that um, you wish that you could be asked so that you had an easy opener or is there, are there any last words that you feel like, oh, you'd really love to just like drive the point home or share this fun detail or is there anything else mm. that we can hold space for? That's a good question. Um, I think the key with this is like to consider the fact that, you know, yes, putting Frankie on such a high pedestal is a problem. But also, you know, one way to, there there are a lot of ways to like bring a person off a pedestal or like change the dynamic. And one of those ways is to like yank the person down and be like, you can't be up there. And, and I feel like that is gonna ruffle some feathers in a lot of different ways and, and I don't even know that that's necessary. What I think might be an, a much gentler way of going about it in a much more integrated way is to consider raising up other voices instead of pulling Frankie's down. So it's mm. not so much that Frankie is being devalued, but that other people are being valued as well. So looking at those Norma interviews, looking at the Al Min stuff, you know, like in some of the documentaries that are a bit older, particularly pre 2000s, because once they hit 2000s, it's 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 a mess. Uh, the ones I've seen, at least. Yeah. Um, but like watching that older material, you know, reading interviews, and like, yeah, I mean, not everyone's going to do archival work which is fine. But like, if you happen to, you know, read it and think about it and consider it um, as well as really listening to your current black community members. Because yeah. ultimately one thing I say in that piece is we as current black people in America have privileges that we were not afforded to before. Mm. So we can say things that people may have felt in the past and be less concerned about dying for it. Hmm. So it's not that we've become more sensitive as time's going on or we're less welcoming. It's that we finally have the safety to say, hey, you're hurting me. And so listening to the pain of the experiences of your fellow community members, as well as the joy and the excitement that they have. Because the reality is anyone who stayed in the Lindy Hop or Blues community, realistically, um, who is Black, loves yeah. that dance so much that even those issues could not keep them away. Oh, great. That was so beautifully said. Thank you so much for sharing that. 
And I guess with that, why don't we wrap things up? So if you are looking to find more of Gray, you can find him at greatarmstrongdance at gmail.com, as well as find him on Facebook and his website, which is obsidiant.com. And otherwise, uh, Gray, thank you so much for sharing so much of your time with us and your brilliance and your research. Uh, you, again, can find that at ilindy.com backslash blog. All right, everybody. Have a good evening or a good day.